Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's episode of Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, and I will be your host today. So today is a special episode. We have Rob Arnott on the show today. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm doing just fine. Great. Well, I'm really excited about this show because uh, for me, this is a treat. I, I love reading Rob's research, um, and I think we're really lucky to have him on the show. He actually wrote an interesting paper recently called The COVID Crash and the Abandonment of the Pensioner. And I've mentioned this in the show in the last bunch of weeks about the pension problem. And we wanted to bring Rob on to talk about that. So just a little bit about Rob, if you're not familiar with him. He's a founder and chairman of the Board of Research of, uh, Affiliates. Uh, it's a global asset manager dedicated to profoundly impact the global investing community through insight and products. He's been referred to as the godfather of smart beta for his pioneering work on the fundamental index. Uh, Rob has published more than 130 articles in journals such as uh, the Journal of Portfolio Management, Harvard Business Review, <clears throat> Financial Analyst Journal, uh, where he served as editor-in-chief from 2002 to 2006. So as you can tell, Rob is a very seasoned uh, expert when it comes to research in the investment space. And a lot of the institutions look to him and his firm uh, for their research. So if that gives you any indication of who we have on the show here, if you're not, then please wake up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Rob, um, I wanted to kind of dig in here because you wrote this great paper on the abandonment of the pensioner. And this has been an ongoing problem for a long time. Um, and I'm really glad you're highlighting it here. So I guess in, in kind of simple terms, like how would you describe the pension problem that we have right now? It's actually very, very simple. Um, you can't fund pension obligations. You can't fund retirement benefits without funding them. Uh, it's, it sounds like a truism and it is, but in corporate America and in the public funds arena, state and and uh, state, county, and city pensions, um, there's this dynamic where uh, if you're running a business, um, the less you contribute to the pension, the more you have for bottom line profits. Uh, if, you have, um, uh, if you're running a state, uh, the less you put into the pension, the more you have to provide uh, services to the state's taxpayers. And so there's this powerful pressure to contribute as little as uh, can be justified. And when this goes on for long enough, you have a, a funding problem with pensions being massively underfunded. Now, when you think about a pension, a pension is a payment over time. Um, there are what are called defined benefit pensions. That's where you know that when you retire, you're going to get a certain pension uh, monthly um, uh, from the day you retire until the day you die. And that payment is, is assured by contract. The, if you think about it, that looks an awful lot like a bond. In other words, you're receiving a payment that uh, is steady over time, just like you do with a bond. So pensions are valued, are, are gauged for whether they're well-funded enough by a very simple question. Could they buy enough bonds, high quality bonds, paying that assured payment to meet the promised obligations to pensioners? It gets a little more complicated because you also have to add in the expected contributions in the years ahead between now and when somebody retires. But um, let, me, let me share a screen because it, it's pretty interesting here. Um, the screen sharing is uh, disabled. I think you need to enable it on your end. There we go. Uh, here you're looking at an exhibit from that article you made reference to, an exhibit that shows the return assumption versus the required return in order to meet pension obligations. So the little green diamonds are state by state around the country. Uh, what what um, 
return assumption is being used for public pensions. We use public pensions as an example because corporate pension data is all over the lot and is harder to gather. But this shows state by state um, assumed returns, that's the green diamond, and the return that would be required in order for them to meet their pension obligations using the um, uh, rate of contributions that are currently taking place into a pension fund. So you can see over here near the far left, the, the leftmost dots are national average. The ones immediately to the right of that are for Wisconsin and then South Dakota. And over on the far right, uh, Kentucky and New Jersey. So here on the far left, you can see the green diamond is at about 7%. That means Wisconsin is assuming that they'll make 7% return on their pension assets. Now in a world of zero interest rates and stocks price to give you a, a dividend yield of 2%, earning 7% on your pension money is a stretch. It's an enormous stretch. Um, the actuarial profession, I think, does a bit of a disservice to the future pensioners. Um, by allowing rates this high, but they do allow rates this high because uh, under actuarial standards, you have to use a bond yield if you're invested in bonds, but if you're using stocks, you can use their past return. Well, the past return on stocks has been wonderful. And so you're able to assume 7% if you're mostly invested in stocks. Now, are you gonna get 7%? Not, not at all clear from today's valuation levels. In fact, I would say, uh, you got a chance in 100 that you're going to earn that kind of return in the decades ahead. In the year ahead, who knows, anything's possible. But in the decades ahead, 7% is an extreme stretch. But in any event, actuaries do allow these the rates noted by the green diamonds. The blue diamond is the return that they would have to earn in order to meet their pension obligations. So good news for Wisconsin, if they earn 6.5%, they're going to meet their pension obligations given their current rate of funding. So they are fully funded, hallelujah, if they can earn 6.25% on their pension asset, which I think is a stretch. It gets worse for other states. Uh, looking over here on the far right, New Jersey is assuming 7.5%. They're assuming that they're going to make 7.5% on their money. That's that's very aggressive given today's near zero yields and lofty equity valuations. But get this, in order to be fully funded, they'd have to earn 13.5% per annum compounded. Um, extravagant rates of return, way above what's been earned in the past and way above anything that's at all plausible today. So you have this massive underfunding issue in uh, state pensions, and uh, corporate pensions are no exception. C closing the loop on this, the reason I called it the COVID crash and the abandonment of the pensioners is that initially stocks and other investment assets crashed in the, um, uh, as the scope of the COVID pandemic became self-evident. Uh, the average pension in the United States lost 10% on their assets in the first quarter of the year. The other crash that gets less attention is the crash in interest rates. Well, if pension obligations look like a bond and bond yields tumble, then you would need vastly more money to service pension obligations with a bond portfolio. So the, the, the value of those pension obligations soared in the first quarter of the year by about 15% if they were marked to market at current interest rates. And so the, the abandonment of the pensioner uh, really means if the liabilities are up 15% and the assets are down 10%, you've just lost 25% funding ratio in your pensions, you're now 25% more underfunded than you were just three months before. Has that picture gotten better since then? No, it hasn't. Stocks have rebounded handily, but interest rates have tumbled further. 
And so with interest rates tumbling further, the liabilities have risen just as much as the assets in the intervening months after the market low in March. Long answer to a short question, but I hope that's helpful and interesting to your, your viewers. It is. It is. And, and actually, as a, as a side note, because you mentioned bonds and equities, you know, typically with a, with a typical pension, what is, what is kind of an allocation? Is it like a 60-40 or what percentage is in bonds versus stocks in a typical pension? 60-40 um, is used as a shorthand to describe a typical asset mix. The implication is 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. In fact, uh, most pensions have much broader diversification than that. They'll have, oh, let's say uh, uh, 50 to 70 percent of their money in stocks, including U.S. stocks, international stocks, um, real estate investment trusts, uh, uh, master limited partnerships, and so forth. Uh, and on the bond side, they'll typically have much less than the 40%, leaving a sleeve for <clears throat> alternative investments, hedge funds, um, private equity, and so forth. But if you just do a simple test, how do these funds perform compared with a passive investment, 60% in, in U.S. bonds, 40% in U.S. stocks, you find that most of them uh, don't beat that simple 60-40 blend. And so 60-40 is a nice shorthand to describe how most, most organizations invest. Um, the fact that they uh, do tend to invest in a fashion similar to 60-40 is one of the reasons that that shorthand has stuck around for decades as a proxy for the way most pensions are uh, uh, operated. Okay. So, you know, you mentioned one thing in the report and you, you had this on the chart before where, you know, you talked about the risk-free rate uh, versus the returns. So how does, I mean, the risk-free rate is, um, has changed obviously um, now that interest rates are lower, but how does that kind of play into this, this pension crisis? Because that to me seemed like a very large part of the report you wrote. Um, let me show a second exhibit that I think will be will help answer that question. Um, here you see an exhibit in front of you, pension funding ratios at various discount rates. Now, if you are 100% funded, that simply means that um, if you continue contributing to the pension at the pace that you've been contributing, that, that you are presumed to continue contributing and if you earn the return that's assumed by the pension actuaries, that you will meet all your pension obligations. So that's, that's where you want to be. You want to be fully funded so that you don't leave a surprise uh, years or decades down the road for pensioners not getting paid properly, for uh, uh, taxpayers seeing their taxes soar, for the citizenry seeing their uh, services provided by the state government uh, uh, crushed in order to leave money uh, to top up the pension. So you have different stakeholders. You have the future pensioners, you have the future taxpayers, and you have the citizenry who expect the state to deliver services uh, in exchange for that, those tax revenues. And what you can see here, um, again, you're looking at many of the same players on each end of the spectrum, but uh, the blue diamonds tell us how well-funded the pension is if they can earn the actuarial return assumption and if uh, they continue contributing at the pace they've been contributing. Uh, contributing at the pace they've been contributing is not that hard, although there's constant political pressure to cut those pension contributions. So you can see here on the far left, again, Wisconsin and South Dakota, 100% funded. Now that's using the actuary's return assumption. What if we use the return associated with um, uh, the long bond, the long treasury bond, which is really the true risk-free rate? Um, 
then Wisconsin would be 50% funded. So basically it says, this, this tells us that they could put the entire pension in a risk-free investment in long treasury bonds, and they'd now have to make up for half of the pension payments that are due. There's several ways you can make up for those pension obligations. One of them is to, um, uh, is to earn a higher return, um, to earn more than the risk-free rate. Right now, the, the risk-free rate is in the low ones, um, uh, let's say one and a quarter percent, uh, at the very long end of the treasury yield curve. Uh, you can lock in one and a quarter percent per year for the next 30 years. Um, all right, well, that's a pretty crummy rate of return. <laughs> and it takes a lot of money to fund pension obligations at one and a quarter percent. Can we do better than one and a quarter percent? Probably. Uh, I don't say definitely. The natural response to that is, well, of course we can do better than that. Not so fast. If you're earning more than that, you're doing it in one of two ways. You're either choosing markets that are riskier and priced to offer a higher return because they're riskier. That's called a risk premium. Or you're earning results that are better than the broad market. You're beating the market. That's referred to in our business as alpha. So you either have alpha, meaning you're beating the market, or you uh, have beta, Beta means exposure to markets with risk. Beta that's exposed to riskier markets. Either way, you're taking risk. They're symmetrical risks in the sense that if, you're, if you think you're earning a risk premium, you're earning a risk premium because there's a chance it could be negative. It's a chance, there's a chance that the performance could be lousy. U.S. stocks from 1929 didn't hit a new high until 1954. That's a quarter century. Uh, and in fact, net of inflation, U.S. stocks were lower after the 1987 market crash than they were at the 1929 peak. That's 60 years. So over those 60 years, your real return on stocks over and above inflation was only the dividend yield. That's all. So the notion that you can earn a risk premium reliably uh, over long periods of time, if you're willing to take the ups and downs along the way, is largely true, but it's by no means assured, especially not if you're buying at a market high. Um, the notion of beating the market, if you own U.S. stocks, you can beat the U.S. stock market for sure, as long as somebody else holds the losing stocks, as long as the person on the other side of your trades is losing money, is underperforming the market. You can't beat the market unless there's somebody underperforming on the other side of your trades. And so beating the risk free rate means either taking, seeking a risk premium or seeking alpha. I'm not saying don't do that. I am saying definitely, definitely seek higher returns. Look to find interesting risk premia that can boost your performance definitely look to find ways to beat the individual markets because it, it can be done with sufficient thoughtful and creative effort. Uh, but that's one way to close the gap. So for Wisconsin, they're assuming because the risk-free rate gets them halfway to full funding and the return assumption by the actuary gets them to full funding, they're assuming that the market is gonna make those contributions for them. The market will make up the difference and give them that 7% return, leaving them fully funded. Okay, well, that's great uh, if it happens. If it doesn't happen, what does this gap mean? It means that the, the shortfall, that 50% shortfall has to be made up in really one of two ways. Either bigger contributions down the road or lower benefits down the road. The pension, the, the future pensioners presume they're gonna get X and instead they get half X or um, uh, 20 or 30% less than they, they'd expected and planned for. Um, either way, there's gonna be, there's going to be someone who loses out. 
uh, the increasing contributions means one of two things, higher taxes to make those contributions or less money spent on the services that, that the citizenry expects from their state, uh, less money for highways and bridges and roads and uh, the DMV and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, less money available to provide those services so that the money is available to put into the pension. You can't have it both ways. So basically you have multiple stakeholders. One or another stakeholder has to lose unless you can earn that premium return, which in the case of Wisconsin would be a 7% return at a time when the risk-free rate is about one and a quarter. Looking at the far end of the spectrum, uh, Connecticut has the lowest funding ratio in the country uh, when we use the uh, risk-free rate. If they earn the risk-free rate, and if they continue contributing at the pace they have been contributing to their pension, their pension is 18% funded. That means they could afford to pay 18 cents on the dollar to their pensioners. Um, hence the term abandonment of the pension. They say not to worry, we're expecting an actuarial return north of 7%. So if we earn that, we're 45% funded. We can afford to pay 45 cents on the dollar to our pensioners. But never mind that, we have a long future decades ahead to make up this huge gap going from 45% to 100%. Well, again, how do you make up that huge gap? You make it up with either um, uh, increased contributions, clearly they'd have to be massively increased contributions, hence massively higher taxes or massively lower services to the citizenry, or massive cuts in pension payments. Now in most states, the pension payments are protected by the Constitution as being sacrosanct, as sacrosanct as state debt. Um, state debt, uh, it's ambiguous, but there are interpretations of the US Constitution, the federal Constitution, that suggest that it is uh, unconstitutional for a state to go bankrupt. Well, it may be unconstitutional for a state to go bankrupt, and it may be unconstitutional for a state to um, uh, stiff its bondholders or its pensioners, but it's not unconstitutional for a state to run out of money and to have to pay these obligations in IOUs. So the risk is the ones over on the far right may have to pay pension obligations with IOUs while slashing benefits, excuse me, while slashing services to the citizenry while at the same time boosting taxes to close some of that gap. And taxes can drive the affluent away from a state. So there's no assurance that that would work. This is a long rambling explanation of a pension problem, but it is a national pension problem. It is a national emergency. In 2001, I wrote a, a, a short white paper that got quite a bit of publicity entitled uh, uh, The Trillion Dollar Time Bomb, referring to state and local pension obligations and corporate pension obligations and the very high return assumptions that were being made that the pensions were going to earn these lofty returns from record highs in the stock market um, as a problem that measured in the trillion plus range. Well, it now measures in the five trillion plus range for state pensions uh, and probably a few more trillion for uh, corporate pensions. So we're, we're looking at a problem that because we've ignored it for 20 years has only become uh, uh, materially worse. Uh, again, seek the higher returns, but you can't fund pension, uh, future pension payments without funding them. Top up the pensions, start putting more money into the pensions, that's urgently needed. Uh, this is no criticism of the state pension administrators. They're striving mightily to achieve the almost certainly unachievable. Um, it's, it's a thankless task, and they operate in a fishbowl. Anytime they have a performance that's disappointing, it's all over the headlines. Yeah, it, it's, and it actually there's a, 
a few points I want to ask you on this. And one point you made was, um, you know, with the with the states, and this is an obligation. The, the, I feel like there's probably like a fine line in there, but um, you know, when you look at things like pensions, uh, if a state can't pay it, right, they have limited options. Is it a contractual obligation or is it a moral obligation to pay the pension with the, from the states? Um, it's obviously a moral obligation. You've made a promise. Uh, you got to keep it. There's 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 a concept in the law called an odious debt. It's a debt that has been uh, taken on by one party, imposed on another party, um, and the other the party obligated by the debt uh, has has had no influence whatsoever in the decision to take on the debt. Uh, this came to the fore during the uh, uh, Iraq war in that Saddam Hussein had spent um, uh, countless billions to build 127 palaces around the country and uh, borrowed money on the international markets for that. And uh, it was pretty quickly denounced as odious debt in the sense that He'd borrowed the money, the lenders lent him the money, knowing that it was an obligation from him, ostensibly from the state, in which the citizenry had no say. Okay, what about pension debt, um, pension obligations? It is an obligation of the state. It is a moral obligation, but it is going to be paid by a future generation that uh, in many cases wasn't even a voting age when these promises were made. So does that qualify as an odious debt? In the context of the law, not necessarily, uh, but from a moral perspective, if, if you have people making promises that um, are implausible to be kept, then um, you do have a, a moral, um, uh, ambiguity. Now, the legal ambiguity disappears in many states because it is a uh, in the Constitution <clears throat> that the pensions must be paid. But like I said, it may be unconstitutional to not pay, but if a state runs out of money, it's not unconstitutional for them to pay with IOUs. Um, uh, there's a final exhibit that I think will be interesting to your viewers. And that is this graph, which shows the per capita obligation uh, of um, associated with the pensions in state by state around the country. Uh, here on the far left, you have Tennessee, where the unfunded pensions, the pension is pretty well funded on actuarial terms, the unfunded pension at the presumed return that the actuary assigns, somewhere in the neighborhood of 7%, is zero. At the risk-free rate uh, of um, uh, 2018, which were the, <clears throat> the year-end 2018 funding uh, status was the last that was available on all 50 states when I wrote this. Uh, by now, you'd have the 2019 numbers. But at the risk-free rate at the end of 2018, that works out to about $8,500 per person in the state of Tennessee, or about um, $34,000 per family of four uh, of unfunded pension obligation if they only earn the risk-free rate. So that says every family of four owes $34,000 that they don't even know they owe uh, to future pensioners, but they got a lot of years to pay it off. So spread that over time, and you might be looking at uh, a thousand or 2,000 a year. A uh, family of four would um, uh, tighten their belt and um, wouldn't go starving if they had to make those top ups. Over here on the far right, Alaska, has official unfunded pension obligations of $10,000 per person in Alaska. 
But at the risk-free rate, it was, at the end of 2018, uh, 46,000 per person, 180,000 per family of four. And after the COVID crash, that rose to 58,000, something in the neighborhood of $230,000 per family of four, quarter million dollars of unfunded pension obligations. Now, Alaska is a special case. They also have um, a reserve fund uh, tied to oil extraction revenues that were paid to the state. And that reserve fund is almost exactly as large as this unfunded obligation. So if you simply take the reserve fund and put it into state pensions, they're solvent. Uh, the same can't be said for Connecticut, where the actuaries say, oh gosh, you have unfunded obligations of 10,000 per person who lives in Connecticut, 40,000 per family of four, but at the risk-free rate is 32,000, it's 130,000 per, per family of four. And after COVID, the risk-free rate tumbled and therefore it's 40,000 per person or 160,000 per family of four. And they don't have a state reserve fund associated with oil extraction like Alaska does. So Connecticut has, has, a, has a problem. They are making relatively high return assumptions to make their pension problem look manageable, 10,000 per person unfunded obligations, stretch it over decades to come, and you're looking at a few hundred bucks per person in increased taxes or reduced services. Okay, well, that's manageable. 32,000 per person or now 40,000 per person, that's not manageable. And so you wind up with a problem that, that will take years to become self-evident, but it becomes self-evident as, as a consequence of taxes having to go up. In Connecticut, they're already pretty high. Um, uh, services to the uh, citizenry um, tumbling to make way for the money to go into the pension or pension obligations paid with IOUs. Um, and it's going to be a mix of those. It's, it's not, it's not going to be either or. You can't pick the stakeholders and say, okay, this group of stakeholders is the loser. We're going to saddle them with this entire gap. Uh, the natural go-to here is to say, well, taxes will go up. Taxes go up, people leave. Um, and uh, it's, it's a simple fact that in net migration in the United States, if you take the bottom third of the country in terms of taxes and the top third of the country in terms of state and local taxes, nearly 100% of the net migration has been from high tax to low tax states. Taxes drive people away. And so when you look at a problem like this, the burden will have to be shared between uh, taxpayers, citizenry expecting goods and services that they don't get, um, and uh, beneficiaries receiving less than they expected, uh, uh, if only by dint of receiving IOU. So this can play out a lot of different ways, but all I'm saying in this article is Brace yourselves. This is going to get ugly in the years ahead. The battles yeah. of years. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I've been I've been watching this this unfold for a while and I appreciate the charts because it, it kind of makes everything really kind of concise. What do you see as as the danger? Where, where's the where's the zone where once it hits that the death spiral is is kind of irrecoverable? Uh, well, I think we're I think we're there. I think it's just, <laughs> um, I think that uh, this will will get ugly because the stakeholders will be doing battle. They'll they'll be saying, um, "Raise my taxes and I'll leave." Um, they'll be saying, "Cut my services and I'll leave." They'll be saying, um, uh, "Cut my pension and I'll sue." And you know, I'll win all the way up to the Supreme Court because it's in the Constitution. Um, and so unless the stakeholders are all willing to cede some ground, uh, this is going to be uh, a slow motion train wreck. Well, I, you know, I asked because there are some states that are like Wisconsin that are in better shape. So, 
you know, I feel like there is a line, I mean, broadly, yeah, I, I, I would agree with your sentiments, but like, is there a line where once, like with say funding ratios where once a state crosses it, because there are some avenues you can look at and say, all right, well, maybe they could fund the pensions a little bit more. Maybe we could get lucky with a few years better return and maybe some fortunate timing. I mean, you, you know, a lot of maybes in there, obviously, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you know, but if you, if you kind of, if you kind of break it down though, not all states are in trouble. So is there a line in the sand where once you cross, you say there's absolutely nothing that can be done with that state? Um, or a range? Maybe there's not a specific. It's, it, it wouldn't be a black and white line. It would be gradations of intensity of problem. Okay. Um, let's go back to this this graph. Uh, if you're over here, then even even with the COVID-induced market crash, if you're looking at fifteen thousand per citizen in unfunded obligations at the risk-free rate. And if, if you can earn superior returns that close this gap part way, the gap from, let's say, near zero uh, actuaries saying you're pretty close to fully funded to 15,000 per employee, if you can close some of that with superior performance, maybe you get 5,000 per, per citizen in incremental um, return, closing that gap somewhat. Then you got 10,000 per citizen to deal with, stretch that over 20 years and you're looking at uh, uh, something, you'd think it would be 1 20th of, the, of that amount, but it's, it's not because um, uh, there is a discount rate on future payments. So it's actually a little bit more than that. But anyway, this 15,000, if you, if you fund some of it out of superior performance of the pension and bring it down to a 10,000 gap. Um, I'm looking at Oklahoma in this particular example as a reasonably well-funded state. 10,000 per citizen, uh, you know, you take an average family of four and say you've got 40,000 of debt you didn't realize you had. Um, what are you gonna do about it? The answer would be, can I stretch my payments over a long period of time? I can handle a thousand or two thousand a year and close the gap. When you get over to the far right, the states like um, Oregon, Illinois, California, Connecticut, um, I'll leave out Alaska because of the Alaska Permanent Fund. Uh, that can fund the pensions if necessary. But the states over here on the far right, California is a prosperous state. But in California, uh, if you say to the uh, citizens of California, each and every one of you has $35,000 of debt you didn't know you had. Each and every one of you in a family of four, um, uh, each family of four has 140,000 of debt you didn't realize you had. Um, that's, um, that's a big burden. And so it crosses a threshold where compromises will have to be made. Now, California already has the highest income tax rate in the country, 13.3. They're talking about increasing it to 16.8. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> so, and it's not deductible. So there goes a third of the money the feds let you keep. Um, uh, if that doesn't trigger a hemorrhaging of uh, the affluent out of the state, you don't want to drive away the people who pay most of the taxes, but that's what's likely to happen. In any event, in California, if you tell the average family of four you've got 140000 of incremental debt, um, that's too large for the typical family of four to take on, and so compromises will have to be made. And how it'll shake out, I don't know. Uh, you've got stakeholders that will be at war. So... One one thing kind of comes to mind because obviously this sounds a lot like the social security problem that our country has as well. Um, and I know people have put like a timeline and when social security kind of runs out of funding, I forget what it was like, you know, 2032 or something, but what, um, I think a lot sooner than that. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I think they don't, there's a lot of things that aren't included in those numbers that they, you know, they, they try to make it a little rosier, but I think the, the question I'm getting to is this, you know, is there kind of like a, a timeline where it, 
where you can kind of look to and just say, well, based on our assumptions, um, here's where the, the, the crisis is actually going to happen because they've been doing this for decades where they're pushing right. out these obligations right. into the future. At some point you have to pay the piper, but you know, where do you see that kind of happening or, or what, um, what would have to happen in order for that to kind of come to a head? Well, it'll come to a head when uh, states' uh, pensions start running dry, and there are some states that are likely to see that happen in the coming decade. Uh, I think both Illinois and New Jersey are currently slated to run out of money in the coming decade. If the pension is dry and the obligation is still there, um, that's when uh, that's when you reach a point where you you must start finding the middle ground, finding the compromises that people can live with. For Social Security and Medicare, you can deal with the problem um, roughly a third to a half way by means testing. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, well, if, if you make 100,000 a year um, on your investments or uh, something like that, why on earth would you need to, why on earth should you expect to receive Social Security? Um, if you view it as a prepaid pension in which there's an um, uh, obligation to pay you because you paid in, and we've been encouraged to think of it that way. If you think about it from the perspective of um, when does the problem become untenable, politics is the art of dealing with crises. Unless it's a crisis, you're not going to deal with it. Why bother? Why worry about it? Uh, anticipating crises and planning ahead is too nuanced for the world of politics. So when does the pension problem become a pension crisis? When the pension runs out of money. And when that happens, the compromises have to be sorted through. Now, Let's take Social Security and Medicare as an example. You could deal with a third to a half of the problem with Social Security and Medicare by simply means testing them. Um, what does that mean? It means if, you, if you're affluent, you don't get it. You don't qualify. Um, how is that fair? These have been sold to us as programs where we pay in and we're entitled to get money back out. Well, back in 1953, the Supreme Court ruled that Social Security taxes and Social Security benefits are two totally independent things, that the one does not create a right to the other. Um, well, isn't that interesting? That just means that it's a source of tax revenue for the government to spend however it chooses, and an obligation that the government must pay out um, based on whatever are the current contractual uh, uh, obligations. Well, those can be changed with a stroke of a pen. What about if you, if you make 100,000 a year, um, you don't qualify. Think of Social Security as um, uh, welfare for the elderly, welfare to take care of those who are older and don't have their own financial resources. Then if you make over 100,000 a year, you don't qualify. If you make zero, you qualify for full benefits. In between, it's scaled in or out. Um, if you view it as separate, I'm paying these taxes, never mind that they're called Social Security taxes. They're just taxes to the government. And these benefits, well, why should I receive benefits from the government, from those who are working, if A, I'm healthy and can work, or B, I'm wealthy and don't need the transfer. Uh, so means testing is the one change in the social contract that has bipartisan support. Um, people are wary of it because it's a political third rail. It's a good way to get unelected. But at some point we cross a Rubicon and we have no choice. We, we introduce means testing. How do you means test Medicare? Medicare you means test by Okay, think of it as um, uh, medical insurance for the elderly. Why should the working and tax-paying Americans pay 
for medical insurance for uh, those who are affluent and could afford it themselves. So how might that work? All right, if you have over a quarter million dollars in personal assets and you go to the hospital and you need some major treatment and it costs tens of thousands of dollars, um, Medicare cheerfully pays you, pays for it, and then cheerfully dips into your bank account and takes the money away until the money's gone. And when the money's gone, you now qualify for uh, the medical care for the indigent. Think of it as Medicaid for the elderly. Uh, something like this is coming. It's coming reasonably quickly, probably in the next decade. We don't hear it talked about because it's not a crisis yet. It's a crisis when the money runs out. The money is going to run out. So when the money runs out and it becomes a crisis, this is the kind of compromise that will be made. The other compromise that can close the gap for Social Security and Medicare completely is to boost the age of eligibility. Um, we're, when these programs were created, you were eligible for full benefits at 65. Why 65? Because most people were dead by 65. Okay, so you're eligible, but you're dead. Uh, <laughs> That's not very helpful. Uh, now, if you make it to 65, your average life expectancy is about 19 or 20 years. So you're expected to enjoy, you're expecting to enjoy the benefits. You work for 40 years and you enjoy benefits for 20. That's an expensive program. What if eligibility start, gets indexed to life expectancy and as we get older, maybe set it at, um, uh, 90% of life expectancy or 85% of life expectancy. If you do that, all of a sudden it becomes a much more manageable program. Well, what would that mean? It would mean if you're, if you're under 70 and not disabled, you don't qualify. That takes the stroke of a pen. Right now that stroke of a pen would be political suicide, so nobody's suggesting it. Sometime in the next 10 years that refusing to sign of that change would be political suicide because the money is not there. And when that happens, the deal will change. The same thing can happen in the pension arena for corporate and um, public pensions, except for one problem. These are contractual obligations. It requires changing the contract. And you have states that have ruled that the contract can't be changed, even prospectively, for people who were hired um, 30 years ago, you can't say, well, we're changing the formula going forward. You qualify for the benefit that you have now, but um, uh, future increases in those benefits are, are reduced. You can't do that uh, in Illinois. The state Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. Um, but compromises like that will have to be made. Um, so I don't see any of this as end of the world kind of circumstance. I see it as um, different stakeholders jockeying for who's got to tighten their belt and by how much. And when you view it from that perspective, none of these problems is um, uh, unmanageable. They're all uh, uh, issues that can be dealt with through judicious compromise uh, among people who have uh, uh, a lot at stake, a lot uh, riding on the outcome of those negotiations. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate all that insight, Rob, and this, is, this has been great. And I want to leave with one final quote, which you often reference is, in investing what is comfortable is rarely profitable. So I, I'd love to get your take on that uh, as we wrap it up here. Sure, sure. Um, anything that is newly expensive, newly overpriced, got there by creating great joy and great profit. And uh, the process of delivering uh, joy and profit makes us all very happy and we want more. This is why we like to buy what's already gone up, as if what has gone up will go up further. It might, it might not. Whatever is newly cheap got there by inflicting pain and losses. Human nature being what it is, 
that's anathema. We really don't want more of whatever's inflicted pain and losses for us. And yet that's where the bargains are. Any bargain will be a bargain by first having inflicted pain and losses. And secondly, by having a narrative out there explaining, here's why what looks like a bargain isn't a bargain. Here's why it's going to get worse before it gets better. And that narrative has power um, and allows bargains to get to implausibly cheap levels. Um, I don't see a lot of bargains in the U.S. economy or markets these days, but I do in emerging markets. Emerging market stocks and bonds are all priced to offer much better returns than U.S. stocks and bonds, but they're volatile and they're unfamiliar. They're, they're, um, they're alien to most of us. And so the notion of putting money there when we've made a fortune on uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and so forth, uh, with a narrative that these latter companies are all beautifully positioned for a post-COVID world, they are, um, but they're expensive. And they're priced to give you a lousy return unless they achieve implausible long-term future growth. So buy those stocks today, you might very well find 20 years from now that you didn't make any money. Um, buy what's cheap today. Uh, the ride could be a little bit of a roller coaster, but um, with a well-diversified roster of bargains, um, you're liable to find yourself much wealthier in 20 years um, by taking those risks. So that's what that, that observation means. Comfort uh, carries no risk premium because it's not seen as risky. Buying Amazon doesn't feel risky, but at its current price levels, my goodness, it sure is. <laughs> well, I agree. And, I, and thank you for sharing that. Cause that's, that's, that's definitely one of my, one of my more favorite quotes. So uh, I appreciate you coming on Rob and uh, where, where can people find more about you if, if they want to learn about you and research affiliates? Sure. Easiest place is researchaffiliates.com. Uh, we actually have two interactive websites that have gone viral. They've become very, very popular. Um, one is called Asset Allocation Interactive, <clears throat> which helps you look around the globe to find what markets are priced to give you a good return, good long-term rate of return in the coming decade. And what markets are very fully priced and are priced to give you a lousy return in the coming decade. Um, U.S. stocks uh, fall in that latter category. Long treasuries fall way in that category. If there's any return to past yield levels in the coming decade, watch out. Those, those assets are going to give you a negative 10-year return. That's scary. Um, and... Uh, there's another uh, interactive website, um, Smart Beta Internet uh, Interactive. So if you Google Smart Beta Interactive, the first non-ad that pops up will take you straight to our website. And uh, that looks at strategies, uh, different strategies for investing, um, and asks the question, are these strategies trading rich or cheap? Are they priced to give you a superior return? Or have they done so well in recent years that they're now priced to give you a lousy return? So between those two websites, you've got um, what asset classes look good today and what styles of investing within the stock market look good today for domestic markets, international markets, emerging markets. Um, powerful tools. We, we've had far more than a million uh, uh, independent uh, uh, hits on those websites um, in the last three years. Well, thanks. For, thanks for sharing, Rob. And I will put the, uh, I'll put all this in the show notes uh, as well as a link to the video and to the, um, to the, uh, the white paper as well, which is a fascinating read. So, so thanks again for coming on Rob and look forward to having you on the show in the future. Thanks Kirk. This was fun. All the best.